How's it going, everyone? Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to thank you guys for taking the time to join us in Hila uh, for this special event for the Solos and Small Firms Committee. Uh, this edition is based off commercial leasing, and we have a very special guest, Mr. Dan Egger uh, from Provista Tenant Advisors. Uh, he's going to give us tips and trades on uh, what to look for whenever when actually looking for commercial properties. Um, and then after that, if you have any type of questions, please just type them in the chat box. I'm pretty sure Dan will be able to get to you guys after um, his presentation. So without further ado, let me introduce Mr. Dan Edgar. He is the owner of Provista Realty Group, a small local commercial real estate company that primarily focuses on the representation of local companies with their leases in or acquisition or disposition of commercial real estate. So prior to starting Provista in 2009, Dan spent 10 years as vice president with Jones Lane Lasalle, one of the largest international real estate firms, where he worked with so many international clients in Fortune 500 type companies. He started his career with PricewaterCoopers in a specialized real estate finance group that did a variety of high level financial analysis of real estate portfolios for institutional investors pension funds, and as well as in, as well as street investment banks. And in Dan's current role, his ideal clients are in square foot range. So people commonly ask this, so that's why he felt the need to put into his uh, bio. So Dan has his master's degree in real estate finance from Texas A&M, he's a fellow Aggie, and an undergraduate degree in business administration from Wichita State University and Wichita, uh, Kansas. Dan has been a proud Houston resident for 25 years. Now he has a wife who owns a legal staffing company, Collier Legal Search. Together they have two beautiful daughters in high school that are counting down the days as they become empty nesters. So guys, uh, without further ado, I wanna give the floor to Mr. Dan Egger. Um, please have your notes ready. Uh, he has a lot to offer. I think it's gonna be very, very informative. Dan. Thanks, George. Um... I guess I'm 0 for 2. I requested walk-up music and Jason's Deli for lunch. So <laughs> thank you guys <laughs> just bear with me. I'm not used to uh, doing a Zoom to a black screen. I, I, I'm assuming there's people out there watching. Um, so as you mentioned, I do represent uh, companies looking for office space. That's my, that's my primary role. Um, whether that's leasing or purchasing office space, um, that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Law firms are some of my better clients. I represent a number of law firms, some downtown, some in the Galleria area. And so I am used to their uh, you know, specific needs and wishes when it comes to office space. So hopefully this is informative and helpful for all you young lawyers out there that are starting your new firms or Maybe you've had a firm for a while and you're thinking about um, your next phase in your, in your office growth. I'm gonna offer 10 tips to looking for office space. This was, was requested by me. And every time I meet with one of my clients, these are pretty much the, uh, the tips that I give and the conversation that we have when um, we start the office search process. Um, Tip number one, I wish I had um, like a PowerPoint, but I'm not that uh, savvy when it comes to doing PowerPoints on Zoom. So if you guys just want to take notes and maybe I can offer up my, my notes um, at the end of the session or that you guys can get that somehow through this group. But tip number one is timing. I always ask my clients, you know, what's driving your decision? Do you have a lease renewal coming up? Um, if so, how far out is that? Six months to nine months is generally um, the renewal time frame that landlords are looking for to start those discussions. So um, that's, that's, a, that's a main factor in looking for office space. Perhaps you're starting a new firm, you're breaking off from an existing firm and you're wanting to start something from scratch. Um, that might be a factor in your timing. Um, you know, I would, and I would say when you're trying to figure out how much time you should allocate towards your office search, factor in the time that it takes to actually tour properties and maybe do two or three rounds of tours. 
Um, in addition to that, you've got to factor in the time that it takes to come to terms with a landlord, to negotiate the lease. All of those things take time to build out the space. Um, building out the space in and of itself could take six months. So don't underestimate how quickly you can get into office space. Now, if you're just a solo and you're looking for an executive office, I mean, you could leave your, leave your office today, go to an executive suite and have a lease signed tomorrow. That's very simple, fully furnished. But if you're looking for traditional office space, you know, that's another story. Okay, I'm gonna move on to tip number two. You have to have a general understanding of the size of space you're looking for. Are you um, two or three people? Are you 10 people? You know, are you looking for 1,500 square feet, 10,000 square feet, 200 square feet? You know, it could be all over the board. Um, you need to have that kind of in your head before you get started um, because that's got to determine what type of buildings we're looking for, what, you know, sub market we're going to look. Um, think about your head count. You know, what is your head count going to be um, immediately and long term? And, you know, these are all things we can approximate up front, but it's something that you need to have a pretty good idea of when you start the search. Going on to tip number three, layout or the configuration of your space. You know, are you private, all private offices? Are you a combination of private and open work area? Um, are you gonna require a, uh, conference room or maybe two or three conference rooms? Are you gonna require a kitchen? You know, all of these things need to be kind of in your mind as you're coming up with your, uh, your plan for looking for office space. You know, what, what is the configuration that we need? What is an ideal configuration? And then laying on top of that, uh, tip number four would be, what are my short and long-term needs? Clearly, you need new office space or you're evaluating your you know, potential renewal for your office space. But when you sign a lease, you know, you're typically signing a three to five year commitment, unless you're a solo, of course, you know, that could be a one year. But a three to five year commitment could mean I'm going to grow my firm. I'm going to add staff over the next three to five years. And so you don't want to get trapped into a lease where you can't add staff uh, two years from now. So make sure that you have a buffer, make sure that you have options in your lease to grow. Maybe you even have an escape clause in your lease. You know, that's not uncommon these days. Uh, something that all tenants of all types are looking for. You know, maybe you have a an exit clause after two years with some sort of penalty, um, or maybe after three years, it's just all negotiable, you know, it's a contract like anything else. And it's all comes down to what the uh, landlords are willing to give and, you know, what kind of credit your, your tenancy offers. Um, tip number five would be, of course, location. You know, everyone always says location, location when it comes to real estate, but you know, when it comes to law firms, you could pretty much be everywhere. There are law firms all over this city, but maybe you have to be downtown next to one of your clients, or maybe you need to be next to another law firm you do a lot of business with. Uh, maybe you need to be near the courthouse or have easy access to the courthouse. Um, maybe you just want to be close to the decision maker's home. That's actually very common. In, uh, in leasing, believe it or not, is when I ask them where do they wanna be and they tell me Greenway Plaza, 99% of the time, the CEO of the company lives in West U. So, you know, Greenway Plaza is one of those markets where it's not easy to get to um, with all the traffic coming from the Beltway or coming from the Loop and 59, but, if you live in if you live in West U, it's ideal. Um, tip number six is we like to 
ask our clients, you know, what type of building do you envision your firm being in? Are you a high rise, you know, class A, class B, downtown type law firm? Are you a, uh, you know, mid rise suburban? Are you something in between? Are you maybe, maybe you want to be in a uh, Montrose or a Heights bungalow and you want to own your own building? There's a lot of, there's a lot of lawyers on Heights Boulevard, as you guys know. Uh, there's a lot of lawyers just kind of scattered around in the inner loop in small buildings. And there's a lot of small buildings in the inner loop. Now, if you want to be out west and you want to be in a small building, that's a little tougher task because there's not a lot of that type of office product out there. So you do have to have an idea of what kind of building you want to be in. and um, you know, that that really plays into where we're going to start the search. And then in terms of that, uh, also, you need to think about the amenities, you know, of the building. If you're looking for a lot of amenities, like a gym and restaurant in the building and all of that sort of stuff, that's pretty much downtown Galleria type firm. If you're looking for restaurants in walking distance and you know, more of a uh, work-life balance type, you know, maybe that's a Heights Boulevard firm. Going on um, tip number seven, of course, this is the biggie, and this is budget. You should have in mind, how much money are you gonna spend? How much do you have to spend on office space? And I know when I ask my clients this, they always, are hesitant to give me an answer because of course, everybody wants to spend as little as possible on office space, but you have to be realistic about how much space do you need versus how much can you spend? Because that's gonna factor into all of these things that I've already talked about. Where can your firm be located? What type of building can it be in? You know. It all comes down to what can you afford? And of course, here's another tip along that line is if you're starting a new firm or you're trying to grow into nicer space, but maybe can't afford it, think about subleasing. Subleasing is an excellent option for a company that wants to upgrade their image, but they can't necessarily afford the class A space. Typically, in a sublease situation, you get furniture. It's typically left over by the previous tenant. And you can typically negotiate owning all of that furniture at the end of the sublease. Not to mention you're going to get a base rental rate that's about 50% of the market rate. Now, that all sounds great. And it's like, why doesn't everybody do that? Well, you're kind of subject to what's available at the time that you're looking. And there may not be any good subleases out there. I've actually have a, have a client that's in a sublease space right now, a law firm, um, and they had been leasing on a direct basis in the Galleria for decades. And they decided that they could upgrade their space on a sublease basis, and we found this seven-year sublease, which was perfect for them. So never discount the um, value of sublease options. And then I'm going to stay on this budget concept for a little bit, because one thing you really have to understand when you're going into shop for office space is you need to understand all the costs that are involved. A lot of times people get hung up on just the rent. And I've had clients call me before when we're in the middle of an office search and they start going online and looking at things on LoopNet and they say, hey, Dan, what about this building or what about that building? It looks like they have space for $20 a foot and everything we've been looking at is $25 a foot. And I say, the first thing I say is, well, is that a gross or a net rate? And they say, I don't know, what's the difference? Every single time. 
And I'm gonna tell you what the difference is. A gross rate is all inclusive. That's your base rent and your operating expenses. A net rate is just your base rate. The landlords then add your pro rata share of operating expenses on top of that. And you pay that on a monthly basis. And that could be, I'm just gonna say hypothetically, a, your net rate is $20 a foot. Your, your operating expense alone can be another 10 to $18 a foot, depending on what kind of building you're in. So now that $20 rate is actually somewhere between 32 and $38 a foot when you factor in the operating expenses. In addition to the operating expenses, you might have parking costs. If you're downtown, you're almost definitely going to have parking costs. If you're in the Galleria, almost definitely having parking costs. All other submarkets, totally negotiable. But generally speaking, you should expect to pay some parking costs, um, unless, of course, you own your own building. Then there's other charges that you have to look for. And this really comes down to when you're negotiating your, your rent, your lease, you have to just look at all the extra charges that will come, come your way, whether that's special cleanings, whether that's security cards. I mean, there's just all kinds of little nickel and dime things that you're gonna experience during your uh, tenancy. And further on the budget, you know, when we talk about budget, we're one of the questions I always ask is if you're going to, you know, buy or lease. Of course, um, I have clients that ask me, "Is buying a building a better decision than leasing a building?" And the answer is, it really depends on what your motivations are, because just as an operating expense, buying is almost never cheaper than leasing. But as an investment, it might be a great idea. I mean, you have to look at it like it's just different. It's a different decision. It's like putting money in a 401k, whereas when you lease, you're just putting money in the landlord's pocket. So yeah, it might cost a little bit more to buy, but you get that back end at some point in time when you can sell it. You generally think, well, that was a great idea that I had 10 years ago or 20 years ago when I bought that building and I, you know, doubled or tripled my money. So, you know, never, never totally write off the, the idea of buying a building, but it's not always an easy decision to make. Okay, I'm going to move on to the eighth tip that I have. And that is make sure the decision maker for your firm is involved in this process. We got somebody knocking at my door, sorry. <laughs> Make sure the decision maker is involved. Um, more than likely, if you're a new firm, that person or that group, that partnership is gonna have to offer some sort of personal guarantee. And I know that most people don't like giving personal guarantees on a lease, but if your firm doesn't have a strong, long operating history of leasing space, then you're probably going to have to offer a personal guarantee. Now, I as a broker, if I'm representing you, I always try to negotiate that out and try to convince them that your firm is good for it. But that doesn't always work unless, like I said, you have that long operating history. Ninth tip, have options. There's no better leverage than being willing to walk away from a deal that's going south. You know, it's like buying a car or buying a house. You want to have a backup plan. So when you go out there and tour space, Make sure you tour several different options and make sure that you don't fall in love with one. Now, inevitably, you probably will fall in love with one, but you want to make sure that 
there's a second and a third place that's like, oh, that's pretty good. You know, I would take that if this other deal falls apart because deals are fragile and you never know what can happen while you're negotiating the deal. You might really get pissed off during the negotiations about some point and decide you don't want to deal with this landlord. Um, you might you might decide that there's just some deal breaker in the lease terms that you can't live with. Maybe the landlord is showing the space to multiple parties and you just didn't act quick enough and you lost out on it. So you want to make sure you have a plan B and a plan C in case they, you know, in case the deal falls apart. And my 10th tip, which is actually tip number one, but I didn't want you guys to think that I was like, given some sales pitch or anything like that. But my 10th tip is make sure you get a broker involved. Now, this should be the very first thing you do when you're thinking about your office space, because the broker, I mean, that's what they do. They know um, how to most efficiently locate office space, how to negotiate business terms. And we all know lawyers are really smart guys and girls. And we also know that they know how to negotiate contracts. In fact, I always recommend that my clients get a lawyer involved when they're negotiating a lease, but that's after the space is found, after the business terms are negotiated. Then we bring the lawyer in for all the legal terms and all the nuances of the lease that um, I just don't have the expertise to negotiate. And I don't wanna pretend like I can negotiate um, you know, all these various legal terms while I've been involved in the negotiations and I've been involved in the calls and I typically know where they're going to end up. I'm not a lawyer. And so I don't try to be one. And I would suggest to all you lawyers out there that your time is more valuable spent billing your clients and working on your cases the last thing you want to do is get bogged down running around town looking at office space on your own and calling landlords and trying to find deals here and there and looking on LoopNet. Um, just, you know, leave that up to your broker. Let them do all the legwork. You don't have to pay them anything out of your pocket that comes out of the, the landlord's pocket when the lease is signed and, um, you know, it's built into the deal. So it's not like you're saving anything by not having a broker involved. I just really recommend you use a broker when you're looking for your office space. And um, you know, I'm going to give one final little tip. Um, it's like the bonus tip, um, number 11, which is priorities. Prioritize your wish list when you get started. And be ready to compromise because you're not going to find that perfect, that perfect office space. Now, you might fall in love with the space that you end up picking and you may build it out to be just beautiful office space. But, you know, all of that takes time. It takes some vision. It takes some compromise. And you probably won't get everything you want. But if you hire a broker, let them do their job and you're patient, you probably will find something that pretty well fits what you're looking for. Now, um, I wanna open it up to questions. I hope I can hear everybody if they have any. And like I said, I'll offer up my notes um, to anyone who wants them after the fact. I'll figure out how to get those out there. But if anybody has any questions, go ahead. So Dan, that was, that was a great presentation. We actually have a couple of questions um, in the chat that was typed in in your presentation. I have a couple from Alvin and then one from Mr. Uh, Clinton Morgan. Let's just take the first Alvin. Alvin, it says, what tips do you suggest for negotiating with the landlord for a rental price or in an escape clause? Well, you know, it comes down to having options, like I said. And so when you're looking at the rental rates, for example, I'm just going to say hypothetically you're looking for office space in the Galleria. You want to make sure you have a couple comparable buildings with, you know, comparable size spaces and you're sending out. So if I'm representing you um, or any broker is, we're going to send out um, what we call RFP, you know, request for proposal. We're going to ask for their business terms. 
And we're going to negotiate against two or three options as good as we can and try to get those rental rates worked down. Now, if you go negotiate um, against one building and you only have one option, it's like, you know, trying to buy a car. It's the, the guy wants $10,000. And so it's like, OK, you offer him 5000 You know, where is that going to end up? Who knows? You know, it depends on the motivation of the seller. And in terms of office space, it just depends on the motivation of the landlord. They know what their space is worth. They know where their deals are landing. Um, I always tell my clients, look, they negotiate deals every single day. And you as a company, you negotiate one lease transaction every, you know, maybe three to five years for yourself. So who has the upper hand when it comes to negotiation? Usually the landlord. So you want to make sure and have some options so that you can say, well, I'm getting a better deal over here. And they have to feel like they may actually lose this deal. Now they have to make the decision, how bad do I want this deal? And, you know, in order to put their best terms forward, it usually takes, you know, something like that to get the best deal out of the landlord. I forget what the second part of the question was. Uh, or some way to get an escape clause. Oh, an escape clause? Yeah, you know, um, I figured somebody would bring up something about COVID during this and how that's affected the office market. That was my And my <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's still kind of to be determined. Certainly there are a lot of companies out there, and I would say pretty much every company out there is trying to figure out what they're gonna do with their office space. And I can tell you that there are lessons learned every time we go through something dramatic like this. And one of the lessons learned from both landlords and tenants are that tenants are gonna want more flexible leases because we don't know what the future holds. We don't know if the government's gonna require another shutdown, you know, whether that's this year, next year, or five years when we have another outbreak. You know, that's a chance that companies, especially the big ones, don't want to take, you know, a big company, imagine if you have 100,000 square feet and nobody's going to the office, what that rent looks like. And you're having to pay that every single month. And trust me, landlords aren't letting tenants out of those leases like you hear about on the residential apartment side. Uh, those, those tenants are still paying those, those leases and they're still trying to figure out if those employees are coming back and at what scale they're coming back. And so when it comes to, you know, what I might call an escape clause or an exit clause, I just think it's going to be more common that you're going to have to ask for that up front. And when you tell the landlord, look, I'm willing to do a three year or a five year lease, but I want an out after three. I want my penalty to be no more than, you know, X after three years. That just has to be a function of the negotiating process and you have to ask for that up front and not you know when you're deep into lease negotiating okay and it seems like that that requires a word from you and what's going on with your uh, business as being a broker well uh, mr morgan has a good question he says how do broker fees work in commercial leases okay so a broker um okay let me start from the the very beginning the when the investor buys the building, they underwrite, they basically create a pro forma of how they expect that property to perform um, from revenue and expense and um, also lease up. So they factor in lease up costs when they buy it. And the lease up costs are, you know, how, how much, how many dollars are we gonna allocate towards building out the vacant space? How many dollars are we gonna allocate towards renewing our existing tenants and are we going to have to improve you know paint and carpet and do those types of things to existing tenant spaces that are coming up for renewal and also factored into those lease up costs are broker fees and broker fees are divided into two you've got your landlord's broker who represents the building and they're the ones that are out there putting signs on buildings and advertising space and then you have the tenants broker who represents your interest and that commission is factored into the lease up cost, the entire commission. So 
if you don't have a broker, they basically keep that entire commission to themselves. It's a bonus to themselves. If you do have a broker, then your broker gets half of that commission. And the commission is 6% um, of the total lease transaction. And so that's how that works. It's you know very similar to selling a house, um, only in that when you sell a house, you know if you're selling your own house, you could like not pay a fee it's just a little different um, in that there are, you know, the fee is actually worked into the deal, no matter if you're represented on the tenant side or not. Okay. And then uh, Alvin has another question. He says, what factors should a future tenant consider on whether to secure property alone or a realtor? Uh, what factors should they consider whether they go out there alone or whether they hire a broker to help them? Is that was the question? Okay. I think he was trying to set um, you. Yeah, so I would, to... <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, if you're just a solo, and this is, I'm just talking from my perspective, probably speaking on behalf of most, a lot of brokers out there, but um, if you're just a solo and you're looking for a single office, like an executive suite, or you want a sublease space on Heights Boulevard or, you know, some small building, and you have connections, um, you, you know, maybe you're going to go sublease from one of your buddies or um, you're just going to do a simple executive office. I would say just go on your own. It's a very, you know, it's not a big decision. doesn't take a lot of time. And it's actually easier for you to do that than to get a, to get a broker involved. It might complicate the process. Now, if you are actually going to have to go out and find like legitimate direct space it may require some build out. It may require um, looking at several options and negotiating with different landlords. Definitely want to get a broker involved because, like I said earlier, your time is more valuable than that. You know, and I would not just lawyers, but any business person um, that owns a business, they don't need to be out there calling signs off of buildings. It's just not very efficient. And as a broker, we have access. I pay uh, money to a subscription called CoStar, which is the sort of like a database that it's sort of like an MLS of, of uh, commercial real estate, um, where I have all of the listings. Um, you, you could get, you could look at LoopNet. I had mentioned that before. LoopNet is not as, uh, substantial as what CoStar is. And so, you know, I just have access to information where you might not have that information and, you know, it's not as readily available. I could do a search in, you know, 30 minutes and tell you all the options with floor plans. And, um, you know, it might take you days or a week to get, you know, get that same type of information. Thank you. Um, what do, you, what do you recommend? We have another question. It says, what do you recommend that a future tenant negotiate for regarding needed repairs if the toilet or sink breaks down? Repairs? Yeah, um, you know, it just depends on the type of building that you're in. Um, if you're in a traditional office building, that's something that the landlord should take care of and it should be part of the um, repairs and maintenance clause within the lease. And... Um, you know, that's just something that's covered in your operating expenses. So, you know, if you are, if you are um, leasing an unusual building where you're in charge of your own repairs, you know, that's something different. But, um, you know, I can't really think of examples other than like, you know, some little house that you're, that you're leasing, like I have mentioned, like Montrose type style um, office. But uh, typically that's, you know, that's the standard landlord expense. Okay, nice. Um, so, and the last question from, from the audience is, do you recommend any sources that can be used, out, whatever it is out there that you guys use in order to look up crime stats? Crime stats? No. Um, don't really have that information. I wish I did. That would be, that would be interesting to see. I guess you're assuming that um, we are, uh, you know, going to direct you to an unsafe neighborhood. 
Um, <laughs> you know, and you know, it, it's a good point is, um, you know, when it comes to looking for office space, it is something that you want to factor in is, you know, the safety of the parking, the safety of the area, um, the, the landlord, the ownership group is a big factor. And I hate to say it, but there are landlords out there that I would not recommend my tenants lease office space from. And it's sometimes it's because they don't run a good building. They don't maintain it like they should. And sometimes it's because they don't really care about safety and security of their tenants. And, um, you know, the only way to get that information is just from experience dealing with these landlords, you know, and I've been doing this for 20 plus years in Houston. And so I know which ones to stay away from without really saying names here. Oh, for sure. And then if I may uh, pitch in, I know when I'm for an apartment, you can just Google it and you can Google as far as like how many times 911 has been called in this area. And it'll let you know as far as uh, what type of crimes it is. You know, it's not as, as uh, concrete and, and accurate, but at least give you an idea. Uh, we have another question that just came in. It says, what is the most common issue your law firm clients have and any advice to avoid? Common issues that they have. Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't think that the law firms are really that much different than, you know, say an oil and gas firm or an architect or, you know, any other type of business. Um, some of them want to be downtown. They want to be, you know, have easy access to the courthouse if they're going to court a lot. Um, you know, that's probably the main issue that I hear is, oh, I can, you know, jump on I-10 and I can be downtown really easy or, you know, I'm downtown and, um, you know, I'm at the court three times a week and so I need to be down there. But, um, you know, as far as law firms go, types of issues, personal guarantee is actually a big one. And I did talk about that earlier. Um, I had a law firm I had mentioned that had been in business for 20 plus years and the landlord still wanted a personal guarantee. And, um, you know, we just kind of held our ground on that and said, look, you can look at the financials. You can look at our, you can call the previous landlord and find out how many times they've been laid on rent, which was probably zero. And you're just going to have to get comfortable with that if you want them to be a tenant here. Okay. And uh, that's that's the last question from the audience. I have a couple of questions that's popped up uh, from and uh, as far as for those that went the commercial leasing route, from your experience, what would you say would be needed or that a certain law firm can do in order to build up their uh, credentials to potential buy their own space? Is there something that you've commonly seen? Okay, they need uh, X amount of lending or X amount as far as uh, credit history. Do you have any insight that you can give us as far as build forward? To buy something? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, you know, it does take money. Um, typically on a commercial loan, I would say, you know, if you have a good banking relationship with which if you have a law firm, you probably do have a banking relationship. Um, talk to your banker and find out what they require as far as down payment. In my experience, you can get a commercial loan typically with 10, somewhere around 10% down. Uh, the interest rates are very good right now. Um, if, as long as you have good personal credit, um, you're probably going to have to be, you know, personal on the on the uh, on the loan. You know, whether that's individual or if you have partners, you could, you know, all be on the loan and all be on the deed. But um, you know, believe it or not, you know, I don't know if it's that surprising, but my, in my business, the sales activity is really good because everyone's trying to buy real estate and um, the leasing is a little bit slower. And um, I think that has to do with low interest rates right now. I think a lot of people have been socking away money the last few years. And I think that they're recognizing that real estate's a good investment in Houston. I heard a stat not too long ago that we've had positive, um, positive population growth in Houston for something like 50 years straight, which mm -hmm. is really unusual uh, for the United States. And of course that just impacts our real estate. It puts a, 
it really, um, you know, creates a serious demand for real estate in Houston, especially in the, you know, central part of the city. And then a follow-up question, given that you see that um, commercial leasing is down, do you see any type of investment opportunity used in order to enter into future contracts with these leasing buildings possibly in the future? Investing in the building? Or yes. What, um, yeah, I think so. You know, when, you, when you're looking at um, especially small office buildings that are for lease, I always think there's a potential to purchase the building and I never rule that out um, if it's a small office building. Now, if it's a big office building, you know, that's a, that's a whole different ball game and a, a different chunk of money that's required. But um, small office buildings, I would say, you know, definitely don't throw that, you know, option out the window because you never know. Um, if there's a lot of vacancy, the landlord's probably feeling some financial pressure and maybe there's an opportunity to buy into it or buy it outright. I like it. Mr. Dan Egger, I really appreciate your time. I think uh, the audience got a lot of information that they can definitely use in their practice and uh, personal lives. Um, we thank you guys. If there's any more questions, please let me know for Mr. Egger. If not, uh, Mr. Egger, if you could um, enter your personal information in the chat box if anyone wants to follow up with you, and that way they can contact you directly either for advice or your services. Um, at that time, uh, Hila, thanks you guys. Uh, my law firm, Leona Guinea Trial Lawyers, we thank you guys. And uh, if you have any more questions, let us know. Please enjoy your, what's today, Tuesday? Please enjoy your Tuesday. Or is it Wednesday? All right. Thank you, George. I really appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Anytime, sir. Be safe. Okay. Bye-bye.